Hello and welcome to Global Eye. I'm Parikshit Lutra. India's maiden indigenous aircraft carrier INS Vikrant was formally commissioned today after completing almost a year of trials at sea. Prime Minister Modi inaugurated the 45,000 ton carrier at the Kochi shipyard. At 262 meters long and 62 meters wide, the 20,000 crore rupee warship is India's largest aircraft carrier to be built domestically. This takes India on par with United States, UK, China, France and Russia, the elite group of nations to build an aircraft carrier in-house. The carrier can accommodate more than 1,500 crew members and nearly 30 aircraft, including MiG fighter jets and helicopters. The first aircraft carrier to be operated by the Indian Navy was also called the Vikrant. It was officially commissioned in 1961 and played a significant role during the 1971 India-Pakistan War. This is when the carrier led the naval blockade in then East Pakistan, now Bangladesh. After 36 years of service, the ship was decommissioned in 1997 before being dismantled and sold. Definitely today, with the commissioning of uh, INS Vikrant, this is a big moment for the Indian Navy. <laughs> भारत का अद्वितीय प्रतिबिंब है विक्रांत आजादी के अमृत महोत्सव का अतुलनीय अमृत है विक्रांत आईएनएस विक्रांत पर हो रहा ये आयोजन विश्व क्षितिज पर भारत के बुलंद होते हौसलों की हुंकार है लेट मी गो अक्रॉस टू एडमिरल सुनील लांबा द फॉर्मर चीफ ऑफ नेवल स्टाफ हुज ज्वाइनिंग अस राइट नाउ एडमिरल लांबा थैंक यू वेरी मच फॉर ज्वाइनिंग अस हियर ऑन सी एन बी सी टीवी एटीन लेट मी बिगेन बाय आस्किंग यू हाउ is this new naval carrier the indigenous aircraft carrier going to add to the capability of the indian navy thank you for inviting me on your channel uh, it's going to make a significant impact on the strategic capability of not only the indian navy but also of our nation india the september is an important month in september 1960 we commissioned the first indigenous ship that is a seaward defense boat of about 100 tons today in september 22 we have built the largest indigenous warship the aircraft carrier inas vikrant uh, inas vikrant when she is fully operational along with her escorts the carrier task force or the carrier battle group will have significant capabilities in the larger reaches of the indo pacific it can project power deterrence diplomacy both flag showing and coercive provide hdr assistance where required monitor the sea lines of communications in the indo pacific so it's not only going to add a capability to the indian navy but also to our nation Right, uh, Admiral Lamba. In terms of warfare capabilities, how how is the INS Vikrant uh, equipped, and how does it compare to the INS Vikramaditya? Uh, in comparison, they are more or less the same. They are more or less the same size. Uh, they will carry more or less the same air wing. At the moment, they will have the air wing of MiG 29K fighter aircraft, along with the Kamo 31 early warning. helicopter and uh, in the year to come uh, the mh60r the anti submarine patrol the multi role helicopter so capability wise the air wing of both vikramaditya and vikrant will be the same with the potential to carry 30 plus aircraft both the aircraft carriers have huge capabilities as as part of the carrier task force right uh Admiral Lamba, do you also feel that, of course, uh, within the Navy there is a demand for a third aircraft carrier, and it is believed that there must always be two 
in service in case one has gone for refitting or any kind of repairs for that matter. Uh, how soon do you think should the Indian government take a decision on this? The uh, second indigenous aircraft carrier will be called the INS Vishal. By when do you think this could be sanctioned? The decision should have been taken as of yesterday. As India's stature grows, and uh, not only in the Indian Ocean, the large Indo-Pacific, we'll have to bear greater responsibilities. And if you want to be a regional power, you can only be on the back of maritime power. So that is why the Indian Navy has always made a case for three aircraft carriers. When you have a, a class of ship, say like if you have three of a class of ship, you'll always find the serviceability of any platform is about 66, 65%. Always one ship will be under a maintenance period or as we in the Navy call the refit. So you need three to have two operational aircraft carriers which are available to you to deploy where the national interest when the need lies. And I think this decision should be taken sooner than later. Right. Uh, when was the idea for INS Vishal, the third indigenous aircraft carrier, first floated uh, Admiral Lamba? This, and why has there been a delay? Carrier doesn't carry the name of INS Vishal. I think this is a name which has been given by the media. We've been talking about IAC-2, that Indigenous Aircraft Carrier 2. Uh, this idea of the IAC-2 was floated, in my, if my memory is correct, more than a decade back. Uh, it has taken different forms and fit. Ultimately, the Navy took a decision in 2016-17 that it would be conventionally powered and not nuclear powered. Over size about 65,000 ton. That is the largest ship which can be built in the building dock in India with the catobar configuration that is catapult launch and arrestor gear, but that gives huge capabilities of operating all kinds of aviation assets early air running, fixed wing aircraft, unmanned platforms, fighters, with the ability to launch with full payload and with full fuel. So that is a proposal which the Indian Navy had put forward. And I think the government should take a decision, like I said earlier, quickly, because it'll take a little bit of time to design it and thereafter build it. Mm -hmm. So in, in, if you take a decision now, right. in my opinion, uh, the earliest you can get the IAC-2 would be in about 10 years' time. Right. Uh, Admiral Lamba, thank you very much for summing up uh, the immediate needs of the Indian Navy and the importance of this moment the commissioning of INS Vikrant and what it means for India's security needs. Thanks once again for being with us here on Global Eye. My pleasure. Shifting focus now. Droughts, forest fires, shrinking rivers. China has been grappling with the worst heat wave recorded in the last 60 years. With more than 70 days of extreme heat and low rainfall, the country's rivers have almost dried up. With Asia's largest river, Yangtze, almost drying up. The devastating heat wave has killed thousands of livestock as several provinces report temperatures over 40 degrees Celsius. Several merchant vessels are reportedly stranded with receding Water levels making navigation completely impossible. There is no respite to the people of uh, China since the pandemic started. The country is still seeing fresh cases coupled with a heat wave, drought, uh, power outage and wildfires. The natural disasters have left a big dent on China's economic health, which is also visible in the country's GDP and manufacturing data. We're now joined by Zongyan Zhu Lu, fellow at uh, the International Political Economy Department, at the Council on Foreign Relations. Uh, Zoe, thank you so much for joining us here on Global Eye on CNBC TV 18. Give us a sense uh, of how these extreme weather conditions are impacting the Chinese economy right now and how this will grow in the next few months. Yeah, thank you very much, Luther, for having me. It's a great pleasure uh, to be here and speaking with you. So let me just, um, you know, uh, step back a little bit and quickly just to give you you know, wh why we are concerned about the Yangtze River, right? And you are absolutely right. You know, your earlier remarks, you, you mentioned that the Yangtze River 
is very important economically and environmentally to China. You know, actually, the Yangtze River is not just important for China per se, but also for the world as well, because we're talking about the Yangtze River being the world's third largest river. And uh, in the context of, the, of China, it provides drinking water to the Chinese people along the waterway as well. We are talking about something around 400 million Chinese people. And when you are talking about the economy, probably you realize, you know, it is the most vital waterway to the Chinese economy as well. And uh, a very important part of the of China's economic growth come from uh, ener energy, right? And uh, the Yangtze River is very important, uh, a very important source of a hydropower uh, for Chinese economy, which relies upon about 18 percent on hydro. And then uh, finally, we're talking also talking about it's very important to the global supply chain because of the because of logistics, because of the uh, ports along uh, the Yangtze River. Now, the droughts really hits a lot of the provinces along the way. And uh, so far, there are about uh, at least last time when I checked, it's about 2.5 million people and about 2.2 hectares of agricultural lands in the area, for example, in Sichuan province, Hebei, Hunan, Jiangxi, and uh, a Chong, uh, the, the city of, uh, of Chongqing. So here, uh, the, mm. the, the, the drought right. is important. So the drought has a very negative impact on the economy. But I would say the challenge to the Chinese economy right now is not just the drought per se, really. You know, we haven't seen uh, power outrage or, you know, the, the government bring back coal-fired power plant the same as last year. Uh, but, 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 you know, the, we are talking about mm. the, the COVID situation really is what is challenging the Chinese economy right now. Right. Uh, yes, uh, we have been uh, hearing about the zero COVID strategy and how it is impacting the economy and the industrial output as well. At the same time, uh, what steps do you expect or do you see the Chinese government taking in order to address the impact of global warming, uh, in order to reduce emissions and also to put the economy back on track? Oh, that's a great question. Thank you for asking that. Uh, China, both China as well as India as well, have made a concrete step uh, to uh, realize their commitment to net zero uh, uh, emissions. So right now, from the Chinese perspective, really the uh, the concrete step is in the area of energy consumption, as well as the technology aspect of it to improve energy efficiency. And within the whole energy aspect, that China has been, you know, President Xi Jinping has made a commitment to say China is no longer going to build a coal-fired power plant abroad, meaning there's no export on that. And instead, China's a strategy has been, especially in the exporting market, has been po uh, putting a lot of emphasis on nuclear energy. So uh, that is one important element that, they, from energy perspective, China will uh, will, will do and has been dedicated to do in order to reduce uh, reduce energy, reduce uh, carbon dioxide. Uh, emission. And then on the other hand, from in industrial uh, mix, China is trying to, very hard to move away and, from the traditional uh, energy intensive growth model and move along the value chain. But, uh, you know, the, the drought really had a knock on effect. So we are not exactly sure uh, if the drought were dragging along, let's just say, moving beyond September. It's, it's unknown whether there will be more coal-fired power plant bring back to work. And if that's the case, it's going to complicate China's um, commitment to the realization to net zero. Net zero. But, you know, you know for, for every country, the, the, move, right. the move towards net zero is going to be, uh, you know, like a zigzag uh, route instead of, um, you know, like a straight line. Right. Uh, thank you so much for joining us, Zoe. And uh, clearly, there is a there is a problem that.
the global economy will also face because there will be an impact on supply chains with key industries in China cutting back uh, production because of the power outages as well. We've run out of time, but thank you very much for joining us with your view on uh, the drought situation, the heat wave and the economic slowdown that we're witnessing in China at this juncture. We're going to take a short break, but don't go anywhere. When we return, we will be getting you a special interview with the United States' youngest sitting senator, John Ossoff, on expanding the India-US bilateral ties, investment opportunities, and much more. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back.